All right, let's start with five. Here we go. Inverse sine of x on negative one to one. I got to wrap my brain around what we're doing now. So listen, this one, several of you texted me yesterday. Every one of these is just show that a rock equals i rock and where it happens. That's all. That's all this is asking because it's mean value theorem. So to know, to understand, so a rock is just slope, right? That's all that is. They give you that big fancy formula, but that's all a rock is, okay? So first thing I'm going to do is slope, but I need to do slope between these two points. These are just my endpoints. So to find the actual points, I have to plug in to find the y value, right? Okay, so where is sine negative 1? Pi over 2. No. 3 pi over 2. Right, so at 3 pi over 2... Right, I got to stay between negative one and one, so I've got to go. You're, how, you knew that. Good job. No, but that was good to know that you had to go with the negative value there. All right, so I have to go instead of calling this. This is three pi over two, right? But to stay, that's still not in the interval. What's half of three? One point five, negative one point five. Uh-uh. But that's what they use. Wait, 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 wait. What's pi over 2? What's pi divided by 2? That's like 1.5 something. I know, that's what I'm saying. They use that. No, we can. Let me wrap my brain around what's going on here. I am. No, I'm thinking about, it's just the domain restriction that's throwing me on this one with the... But if you go straight to the formula... That's what I'm saying. Okay, so... I'm I'm getting caught up in in domain restrictions inappropriately here. Yeah, like I'm not thinking about it the right way. I know what it is. I know what it is. I can show you better than I can tell you. I know what it is now. Mm -mm. I know what it is. And and I could sit here and, and, and tell you this, but you're going to go, I don't know any of that. Remember how I told you that inverse, I don't have my calculators. Um, Dinsmore's got all my calculators. I can't show you on here. Here we go. This is why, this is why. Look at inverse sign. Inverse sign is restricted in and of itself. Remember how I told you that inverse sign on the graph is just the flip, like if you invert X and Y axis. Yes, I did. I did. I did in pre-cal. All right. So in other words, sine, the sine graph looks like this, right? Inverse switches X and Y. If I switch X and Y and I turn it on its side, it wouldn't be a function anymore. So in order to maintain functionality, we restrict the domain. So here's my restricted function. So when I talk about what is the inverse sine of negative one, 
Well, whenever it's negative 1, it's negative pi over 2. Whenever it's 1, it's pi over 2. Yes. I was getting, I told you I wasn't thinking about it right. Not to scratch all that I said in the front about the domain. The function itself, this function is restricted. The domain of this particular function is from negative one to one, right? Negative one to one. The range of this particular function is from negative pi over two to pi over two. So if I plug in negative 1, what do I get? I get negative pi over 2. Okay, so now f of 1, if I plug in 1, i get my brain back right. I get positive. Okay, so the whole point of this, a rock equals i rock. That's what I'm showing. a rock is slope, yes? So a rock is, subtract the y's, Divide by, subtract the x's. That's 2 pi over 2, which is just pi over 2. That is the average rate of change, yes? I need to show that that equals I rock. How do I find I rock? Find the derivative. What is the derivative of inverse sine? 1 over. So then it's, okay, so it, go ahead. Do you understand where this, all that came from? Okay, so pi over 2 plus pi over 2 is 2 pi's over 2. Because you combine the numerate, which is just pi. And then the bottom becomes 2. It's kind of confusing because it goes back to what you started with. It's a little weird. All right, so are you, what? You about to say something? Sorry. Are, are you those on the Well, so if I'm asking myself where is the inverse sine negative 1, and I'm looking at my unit circle, well, I know that sine is negative 1 at 3 pi over 2. But that's not in inverse sine's domain. I have to stay between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So that means I have to be on this right side of the circle. So on just the right side of the circle, but going from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Like, don't call this 3 pi over 2, call it negative pi over 2. So this. Um, 7 pi over 4 would be negative pi over 4 instead of 7 pi over 2. Should I need it? <clears throat> yes. All right. So, a lot of you, I think, are confused by the C, maybe. Don't put C, then. Just leave the X in there. Where does I rock yeah, equal A rock? Okay, so, yeah. Just, I mean, why change it, right? So, let's just leave it as it is and just say where... Does I rock, does I rock equal A rock? Where does that happen? The variable itself doesn't matter. If you put a C in there, fine. If you didn't put a C in there, fine. Leave it as X and tell me where it, you're, it's the same thing. If you want to, but you know what else you could do? It's the same. So pi times the square root of 1 minus x squared equals 2. And it ends up the same thing. Square both sides. 4 over pi squared. Subtract 1. Flip everybody's sign and take a square root. I'm going to make this 1 minus over pi squared. Don't make this 1 minus 2 over pi. Because it doesn't work like that. The only way you can 
split up radicals that way is if you are multiplying inside. No, it's killing a puppy. It's a little worse. <laughs> then don't do that. It'll never work. Put in some numbers. What about the square root of 3 squared plus, um, I don't know, 16 squared? Or let's, we'll make it easier, 2 squared. Would that give you, the question is, would that give you 3 plus 2? The big question. 9 plus 4 is what? Is the square root of 13 equal to 5? No. Exponents first where? I was just showing, they said, why doesn't it work? I said, well, put in a, a simple number. Put in a simple example to see if it works. What? Radicals are a grouping symbol, huh? Yeah, number nine. Did we finish that? We're, oh, yeah, that's it. <sighs> Is that what they got, by the way? Seven and nine, number seven. So for this one, let me read it. I haven't, I'm just copying it. Um, all right, so we're still stating whether or not it satisfies the mean value, first of all. It doesn't satisfy. I don't even have to do any of that because it doesn't. Why, Anna, does it not satisfy? It's not continuous on its interval. Look at the interval. It said from zero to pi. Where is the possible break? Where's the possible discontinuity? Pi over two, right? That's where they're, so the question is, at pi over two, do they have the same value? That's gonna check, that's gonna check go. continuity. Yeah, you have to do it. Is it continuous on its interval where the only place that it might not be continuous that I need to check is at pi over two, because that's the break here. So does the cosine of pi over 2 equal the sine of pi over 2? That's a big question. So look on your unit circle at pi over 2, right up top. No. So I stop and I say, does not satisfy... Mean value theorem because it's not continuous... On its domain. That's because. All right. So remember, if the answer is ever no, then you just stop. Stop. What else? Nine. Boy, I missed this yesterday. Instead, I'm sitting in a courtroom. <laughs> the look on her face when the judge that walked out was the same judge that y'all did junior leadership with, though. What's funny? No, she was. She went. Oh my gosh! I can't stand up before him. He was scary to the other people. He told. Him. This one asks you to find the secant line and the tangent line, tangent line parallel to the secant line. So the directions for this says, 
um, given two points, and then they give you this interval on A, B, use, and they give it, they make it a lot more complicated than what it actually is. But they want the secant line, and then they want the tangent line that's parallel to A, B, or to the secant line. So first of all, let's talk about secant line. What do you need to write the equation of a line? Slope. slope and point. Always slope and point. How do I find the slope of the secant line? Normal line. Why is it What else did y'all say? Secant tangent. Oh. Three types of lines you need to know cold. <laughs> well, Parker has has decided he will never speed because one, he doesn't want to have to write a paper, but two, after we told the stories of the court case yesterday, he said he didn't want to go to court. All right. We all learned a lesson. That's right. We all learned a lesson. All right. But you know what? Russell has to pay the consequences if Russell gets caught speeding. Who pays the consequences if Kenzie gets caught speeding? You pay your insurance, you pay all that. <laughs> Russell. Okay. All right. <laughs> insurance for rest. All right. Secant. Secant line goes through any two points. Okay. Secant line goes through any two points on the graph. That is what a secant line is. A tangent line only intersects the graph at one point. This deals with A rock. This deals with I rock. When do you rock? You don't. Normal, just kidding. Normal uh, line oh, perpendicular. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was just picking. I was just picking. I was just picking. Okay, normal line is normal line is perpendicular to the. All right. Because <laughs> I have bullied you today. <laughs> the bully police. Wee -oo, wee -oo. All right, let's reel it back in. Um, is that me? Oh. It sounded like me. Okay, so here we go. It wants to know, and now I got write an equation of the line for both. So for the secant line, I need. How am I going to find the point? You need the slope. That's right. So I'm going to do f of 0.5, and I'm going to do f of 2, right? So 1 half plus 2, does that confuse anybody if I go ahead and flip it? Yeah. This equation, I plugged in 1 half first, and then I'm going to plug in 2. This is my, they just wrote it a different way, but that's my interval. Um, one half plus two is two and a half, which is five over two. F of two is two plus, oh, is it the same? Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. What does that mean? Okay, so the slope of the secant line, yes, I have a horizontal, okay. But the slope of the secant line, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The slope of the secant line is zero, yes? Which means it's horizontal, yes? Yeah. So it's x plus 1 over x, so it's x plus the flip of x. 
right? So I could write this as one half. So if I did one half plus one over one half, that's the same thing as one half plus, and I could flip this. Um, so what's the equation of the secant line? Y equals, it's a horizontal line. It has no X, slope is zero. I haven't, I have not. It, well, it asked two things. It asked me for the equation of the secant line through those points, done. Then it asked me for the equation of the derivative line, of the tangent line that is perpendicular to the secant line. So that means my slope of my tan line, which is the derivative, has to equal what? A zero. So let's take the derivative. Derivative is, what's the derivative of x? What's the derivative of one over x? Or that either one works, right? I want to know where does this equal zero? Yes? Uh uh. Why? <laughs> Why? If you flip it, what do you get? You can butterfly it, you can flip both sides, you can multiply both sides by x squared. You can't focus with what? Is this not what y'all got? Is this not what they got? All right, so look, this is where it happens, yeah. Huh? Um, if we keep going down this road. All right, look, you really have to wrap your brain around what they're asking you here because I still haven't answered the question. I've got this crazy graph, whatever this graph may be. I know where my tangent is has a slope of zero, where it does has this zero slope, but I don't have the equations of those lines. And since they're horizontal lines, they're of the form y equals something. So how am I going to get the y that corresponds to the x? You plug it in. We're just going to plug it in. You can't, Anna says you can't plug in negative one because what? Where am I? F, right. What is my interval? One half to two, that's right. Because x equals negative one is not in the domain. All right, so f of 1, my original equation is x plus 1 over x, so 1 plus 1 over 1, which is 2. All right, so the point of tangency is 1, 2. The slope is what? What's the slope? 0. What's the equation of the line through the point 1, 0, with slope of, or through the point 1, 2, with slope of 0? That's the slope. I mean, the equation of the line, yeah. The slope is zero. If you plugged it in, I mean, y minus 2 equals 0 times x minus 1. That's all just zero. So y minus 2 equals 0, y. This point, I plugged in 1 because that's where I got 1 here.
Are we almost done? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Be quiet, please. Please cease talking. <laughs> it was a funny shut up, though. All right. 23 to 28 ask you to find what? Find local extrema intervals on which I'm increasing and intervals on which I'm de decreasing. This goes back to what we did in the beginning. This is just that first derivative test. Okay, we're going to talk about tomorrow. We talk about the second derivative test. First derivative test tells us increasing, decreasing maxes and mins, and that's all they're asking you for. So if there is a domain restriction, then I must check the endpoints as well. Does something like 23 have domain restrictions? Does it have a restricted domain? You sure? I'm pretty sure 4 minus x has to stay greater than or equal to 0. Does it not? Can you have imaginary numbers? My domain on this is negative infinity to four. Because it's a radical. All right, so just keep that in mind. Let's do the derivative. So anytime, so you're looking for two main things when you talk about domain restrictions. This one's more algebra two than it was pre-cal. Um, <laughs> You're looking for radicals and fractions. In radicals, you got to be bigger than zero under the radical. Otherwise, you're in imaginary land, and we're talking about real numbers here. If you're in a fraction, the bottom can't be zero because you're undefined. And you leave those out of the domain. So I'm just saying, and if you graph it, it should back that up. Let's see. X times the square root of. x times the square root of, what was the rest of it? Smaller than 4. <coughs> Just a crazy little function. All right, shh, shh, shh. here we go. Yeah. All right, let's do the derivative. Derivative of the first is, why am I doing derivative of the first? Product rule. It is a product. It is x times this, so I have to do product rule. Derivative of the first times the second. At 9.15, I'm going to go ahead and show you something i got to show you, and then I'll finish working problem. Plus, it means I'm going to go ahead with my lesson today, and then one half, nine, and then chain it. Is it easy or what? I think it's easier to raise it to the one half. You don't have to if it confuses you. <laughs> you got to do one of the ways. I would always change it to one half. That always helps me. All right, so I've got square root of 4 minus x. Now, here's where it does get a little confusing. Uh, minus yes, 2 times the square root of 4 minus x. What, I, I can't lose track of what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find where it equals 0 because those are going to be my stationary points, right? That's going to be, so what'd you say? What? Kill what? I didn't kill a kitten. Oh. 
If I am solving this one, what I'm probably going to do I just added this to this side. I'm probably going to cross multiply just because I see these being the same and I know that they will cancel. So x equals 2 times the radicals cancel. I've got an equation I can work with now. That looks a lot better than what I had to start with, yes? The answer for what? That's not what they asked me, though. They said local extrema increasing and decreasing. How do you know it's a max? This is a calculator problem. What I would do if I was doing this and I had my calculator, I would have f of x in my y equals, not my, or actually I would have both. I would have my derivative and this, or you could just have f of x and you could do n deriv because all I need to know is a sign whenever I'm smaller than eight thirds and a sign whenever I'm bigger than eight thirds, positive or negative. So that's what I'm saying. I would use my calculator to test it. You see what I'm saying? Well, then I would go back to my derivative and I would say, okay, smaller than eight thirds, but remember it can't be. Yes. Well, depending on what the function does in the beginning, if it's increasing or decreasing, you may or may not. And what it does here, I, let me show you. Let me show you. Um, okay, so smaller than eight thirds, I would probably think somewhere around zero. And I'm going back to my derivative function. Um, if I plug in here, anything smaller than 4, this is going to always be positive, right? Right. Right. But what I'm saying is, in looking at this, I would definitely use my calculator on this because that's why this is a calculator. But anything smaller than 4 that I plug in here, is going to make this positive. So I'm not even going to worry about testing that part is what I was saying. So on, again here, this part is always going to be greater than zero if my x is, does that make sense on what I'm doing there? If it's less than four, that's going to make this positive every single time. I did my domain to make sure of that. So really, whatever the sign of x is, is also the sign, right? Because there's a negative in This is the function. So it should be positive and then negative. I need to come, I can't use this rationale with the roots, the signs of the roots and everything. That's why you need a calculator on this one. That's why this is a calculator on this one. Put, no, you do have to do it. Put, put this in y equals and do in derivative. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. actually. Do here, I would do in derivative. Um, Remember, you do y1, x, and then you tell it where, so I'd pick a point here, zero maybe, whatever it is. See if you get a positive or a negative. For this one, end of y1, x, I'm sorry, I don't have my calculator. What's between eight-thirds and four? In the original, okay. 
Yes. Zero and three is what Anna said to use. That works. Those are easy. Zero is easy to use, yeah. Three is it, yeah. Right. All right. I still haven't answered the question because the question was, where are the extrema? Um, if you think about what this is looking like, think about in terms of like a quadratic even, and it keeps going, but it's cut off right here. So since this goes down forever, this is never going to be an absolute min. You were asking, do I test the endpoint, right? No, because it is a relative min because it's the endpoint, but it's not an absolute. And so I'm not even going to, I would not include that. Did they include it? Oh my gosh. All right. So what I'm going to do, look, F of eight thirds. Again, if I already have this in my Y1, I'm just going into my table and typing eight thirds to find out what it is. I think it comes out to be approximately what? I don't know. They have it as a, to save time, I have lost about two thirds of you and then I'm missing a third of you. I guess I will go ahead and test four and see what, what I get. I think they did. Yeah, they did. What's F of four if you plug in four? Should get zero. So I have a max of 16 root 3 over 9 at x equals 8 thirds. I have a minimum of 0 at x equals 4. It's not absolute, so don't count it as absolute. I am increasing from negative infinity to 8 thirds. This is, this is where I told you some things changed here. It's a bracket. I disagree with that, but okay. This is like the door that's both the hallway and the room. Decreasing goes from eight thirds. Start those last few that you're still having trouble with, and let me talk to you about a couple little things, and then we'll come back to them. Put a pen in it. Yeah. It's just the last little piece of this one that we didn't get to before. Antiderivatives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did y'all have to do that? Y'all didn't do those. Nobody even said anything. Yeah, because we assume we had to do it. Y'all are quick to bless you. Yeah, if we if we complain, you're like, oh yeah, I ain't gonna complain. But you still do it, so what difference does it make? That's exactly how I sound. We learned that from um. Hoopy. Charlie Brown. Did you finish that out? I don't. You didn't do anything kind. You didn't do anything kind either. Oh, yeah, she did. You did get a ticket. That's what Wyatt said. Not that Wyatt. <laughs> you automatically assumed it was this Wyatt and it's that Wyatt. Okay. Y'all ready? Forward. What? Forward. Forward? Forward. Forward. Y'all are real jerks today. Okay. 
On anti bullying day. <laughs> if I asked you to find the derivative of this, what would you tell me? 6x squared plus 10x, right? So that's going forward on the No, no breaks. You don't have enough breaks today. Okay, so if I am taking the derivative here, my question is, does it matter what this is? Does it impact this derivative at all? It doesn't matter, right? Because the derivative of a constant is zero, right? Derivative of a constant is zero. So here's what we're going to do. When we do antiderivatives, we're going to start with the derivative, and we're going to move up. This, but I have no way of knowing what this constant on the end is. So every time it could be nothing, it could be zero, it could be so. Every time you take an antiderivative, you first I add one to the exponent. Because before I subtracted, right? And then I divide. No, that's right. Trust this, this is right. But look, you know that the derivative is right. This is whenever it starts getting confusing, in my opinion, because you start getting mixed up on what you do when. You just go backwards. It's exactly what you're doing. But some things are not power rules. Some things are natural log or some things are cosine and sine. So if you look at your green sheet, on the back of your green sheet, I don't think I have a green sheet. We're going to talk about integrals, but... For right now, those first three, you can definitely do. That is, integral is just a symbol for antiderivative, and we're going to talk about what it means and all of that good stuff really, really, really soon. But for right now, yeah. Y'all did odds. Now, let me show you this. Derivative of f of x, we say, is f prime of x. Second derivative, second prime. But if I go backwards, so in other words, I start with f of x, I can say that the antiderivative is capital F of x. This seems really silly, but there was a question not too long ago on multiple choice where they said, which one is the correct antiderivative and of f of x? And they literally said f of x equals, and they put the correct antiderivative but they used the same notation that was wrong. You had to pick the one that was capital F of X instead of, like, it's so crazy. So, what thing? We will. All right, so don't forget plus C, working backwards, and then the notation for antiderivative. Let me do one with you. I'll do the three odds that you did from it.
if you were asked to find the antiderivative of second derivative, forward, forward. the antiderivative of this one would be the first derivative. Mm -mm, nope. This is just the progression going backwards or going forwards or whatever. It's just, if you take the derivative of capital F of X, like if you take the derivative of this, it's F of X. Antiderivative. Huh? Yes, yes. So, for example, 29. 29 says f prime of x equals x. If I'm finding the antiderivative, then I'm finding f of x, right? Do y'all all agree with me? Okay, so f of x equals, if I started with f of x equals x, then the antiderivative would be capital. Why would you want? You just might have to. It's just, yes. If I did the antiderivative a second time, it would be capital F of X. Yes. This is, this would be, if this is, if this is lowercase f of x, yes. But this is the derivative, not the antiderivative. Yep, 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 yep. Huh? You did this on the test? Oh, I'll show you a couple. <clears throat> Don't forget the plus C. So the capital is only if you start with F of X. It's kind of like position, velocity, acceleration. If I start with, if yes, if I start with velocity and I take the derivative of that, then that gives me acceleration, right? But if I go backwards, it just depends on where you start. It's just another way to call it. So the progression is capital F of X, F of X, F prime of X, F double prime of X. It doesn't matter where you start. If you do an antiderivative, you end up one level above. Well, everything can have a derivative, and everything can be a derivative. Everything can be an antiderivative. Yes, because you got the plus C. The C could be anything. Now, what's, if I started out with this, that's what I had here, look. If I started with this, what's the derivative of that? 1x. 1x. There's no plus nothing. So this function has an infinite amount of antiderivative. Because that C could be any constant in the whole world. It's, <laughs> you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. Look at number 31. You could. No, then I don't know what the notation is. We only use this notation when we're doing antiderivatives and not when we're doing integrals. 
which is not, you might do, it's a very small percent where you use the notation. Most of the time I'm saying, what's the integral of x dx? And we'll get to that pretty soon, but you don't have to know the notation of, no, it's not as bad as it looks. Yeah. All right, 31. Find f of x. F of X. You don't get this? No. Oh. Find F of X. Yeah, you do. You like this? <laughs> so, what did I take the derivative of to get there? We just do it and then we follow with a plus C every time. Apparently, you're not supposed to say boy anymore. It's not racist. Find the derivative, the anti derivative. Find f of x. What does that mean? DOI? What does she say? A BOI. Find the antiderivative. It's not one. If it's one over anything, it's natural log. Now, I could make you find the specific antiderivative. I could say, what if I said, find the antiderivative who goes through the point, I don't know, one, one, zero. This means I plug this in and find C. This, whenever I tell you what point it goes through, then you've only got one specific antiderivative because I'm telling you to solve it for C. So zero equals the log, one plus six is seven. So what is C? Negative log seven? Because I gotta solve it for C. So the antiderivative is log, x plus 6 minus log 6. So two takeaways. Antiderivative with the plus C. Number two is using that point to plug in to find the value of C. Now I say number two. I was holding both fingers. A lot. These are easy. Which one? These are multiple choice. 